part of growing up is growing apart. Most of us, all of us hopefully, had a small, comfortable group of friends in high school we seemed to do everything with. The folks who seemed to always be around, showing up, dragging you out to do this or that. But as we get older, we find the friends of our childhood are mostly friends of convenience and necessity. The only people remotely like us in the small world of childhood who, as adulthood approaches, no longer seem comfortable or even friendly, but restrictive, jealous, and even possessive. Today's story concerns the end of just such a group of friends as they begin their senior year of high school. These four aren't lucky enough to simply grow apart, however, because some twisted and crooked thing has endeavored to make their parting far more deadly. But before we begin, I've got some recommendations for you. Our random horror recommendation for this month is the multiplayer asymmetrical horror video game Dead by Daylight by Developer Behavior. Dead by Daylight is basically a horror-themed game of hide-and-seek tag where getting caught means death. One person plays as a mostly unstoppable killer, stalking the other four human players through nightmarish, randomly generated maps using powers like teleportation, invisibility, and a good old-fashioned chainsaw. The four survivor players have to use their wits to sneak around the map repairing generators that power exit gates. If they escape, they survive and, if they don't, well... They end up hanging on meat hooks as sacrifices to a nameless, faceless entity. The game has a slight learning curve to it, but if you like team-based strategy games or just running around hacking people to death with a machete, you should for sure check out Dead by Daylight. It's available on the computer and most consoles, and if you're not positive whether you're ready to play it, I've started streaming gameplay from it most nights at twitch.tv slash westsidetyler. I'll talk more about that later. This month's literature recommendation is Stephen King's seminal work, It, which at this point I'm almost positive doesn't need an introduction. Still, if you're not familiar with It, see what I did there, the story concerns the life and times of a group of childhood friends over two major periods in their life. The first, set in the past, is their time as youths uncovering the mystery of the strange, murderous clown hunting children in the town of Derry, Maine. The second period sees them as adults 27 years later when they're drawn back to the town to put an end to what they started as kids. It's a massive, epic tale and one of my favorite horror stories. It's also incredibly long and, uh, well, let's say a touch different in places if you're only familiar with one or both of the movie adaptations. Regardless, it's pretty much mandatory reading for any real horror fan. Really, it's our war and peace, I guess you'd say. So, check it out and give it a read, and then come talk with us about it in the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club. I'll get into that a bit more after the episode. Now, for those of you who don't know, this season will be different from all preceding seasons. Every story is going to be told in full, in one shot, no matter how long it is, which means most episodes are going to be pushing an hour and a half to two hours. So, sit back, settle in, and get ready. Without further ado, today's story. The Umbrella Man. I won't pretend to understand what happened. What's happening? It was the summer of 1993 in the South Hills neighborhood of Charleston, West Virginia. If you've never been there, I'll paint a picture for you. The city lays in the Kanawha River Valley, glowing like a puddle of jewels after sundown when you look down from the hundreds of hidden and not-so-hidden overlooks south of the city. That's on the other side of the river, where I lived. South Charleston, it's called and I lived part way up one of those rocky cliff faces. My house was built on a flat chunk of land blown right out of the limestone maybe 80 years ago, when the rich hilltop family decided they wanted one of those newfangled asphalt roads to wind all the way up to their front porch. Those were the Compsons, whom you've probably heard of before if you've done even a shallow dive into our state's history. They're still around, of course but now much diminished and living in normal-sized houses like my own childhood home. A stately, middle-class, three-story built on the land the Compsons had to sell, piece by piece, when their fortunes faded, with off-white siding and green shutters and a wonderful view 
of the Kanara River when the wind blew the trees just so. It's on the cracked, gray, concrete sidewalk in front of that house that this story begins, with me waiting for my friends on a blue, spring-loaded mountain bike Dad had bought from a second-hand shop. Marley showed up first, because he always did, riding a somehow cheaper-looking and more expensive Schwinn, then Asshole, the unfortunate nickname of Michael Collin, my oldest friend, and Ricky both on BMX bikes with oversized pegs on either side of their back tires. We talked for a second and then drove off toward the top of the hill, none of us knowing at the time that we were about to bury ourselves in a shitload of trouble. The mission was simple. Ride up and down the mountains in search of abandoned houses to claim as our own. The South Hills are full of them. Foreclosures abandoned by the families that couldn't afford them, slowly going derelict as the woods devoured them. What we wanted was a place to bring girls and smoke pot, maybe even get drunk and listen to music on the weekends. The golden years of our youth were long behind us, so if you're imagining this as one of those Stephen King boys on bikes stories where we all learn about life and each other, well, strap in, Jack. It ain't like that. We'd all sort of started hating each other, in the early part of our senior year of high school, a persistent feeling that grew in time with the piles of gold and red leaves covering everybody's lawn. Ricky hated all of us because we were going to college, and me, Mike, and Marley hated him because he was always whining about how he wished his dad could afford to send him to school. Me and Mike hated Marley because, of the two of us, he was the one that was actually going to make something of himself in school. I wanted to write, and I was secretly ashamed of that fact, and so I hated the guys because I couldn't share that passion with them. Though I wouldn't understand that about myself until maybe two decades after the events of that cold autumn afternoon. Mike, lastly, hated us because we'd called him asshole for going on twelve years. I thought about the day he got that nickname a fair bit over the years, and even on that cold October day, swerving and pumping my legs and standing tall on my pedals to maneuver around rocks on the path. All of us had only just met. We were six and listening to Miss White, our teacher, reading off the roll call before we got on the bus. She'd said Mike's name, Michael Colon, and without skipping a beat, Marley had said out loud, Colon means asshole. And there you had it. For now and forever, Michael Colon was to be called asshole. It wore on him, badly, and I can't say that I was some great friend he could always lean on. In fact, we sort of hung out just because we all lived on the same flattened part of the mountain. Our homes were all within walking distance. There was no greater purpose to all our mutual friendships than convenience. We overcame no mutual struggles. Hell, we barely had anything in common interest-wise other than doing whatever we could to forget that we lived in Charleston, West Virginia. Ricky discovered pot in middle school, and that became a better glue for our fellowship than any other singular act of kindness or intimacy. He often wondered aloud that we only hung out with him because he had weed. Really his way of saying that it was time for one of us to fork over twenty bucks for pizza. We rode through the chilly silence of late October, leaves crunching beneath our tires and kicking up in wakes behind us. Ricky led the way cutting into and through the backyard of a random two-story house on a sharp incline and digging his heel into the dirt to turn. We followed slowly behind him, then opened up in full as we turned out onto a hidden game path that shot us straight through the trees. Then we were on old asphalt in a dead, abandoned neighborhood. Ricky idled and we pulled up beside him as he pointed out the forms of desolate homes alongside the old street. I looked downhill, where the road ended in a patch of thick, high grass covered in leaves. It had been so long since somebody paved it that the forest had simply swallowed the old road up. These are all foreclosures, Ricky said. My dad knows a guy comes up through here to pull all the old copper. He spit and adjusted his sweat-stained camouflage baseball cap. They're like, thick down here, but they get sparse up near the top. We followed him through the dead neighborhood, the houses more like headstones than what I'd seen in any graveyard. 
They also seemed less anonymous than the houses in my own neighborhood, as though my mind was trying to see what they'd look like when they were still occupied. Alive. This house, with the red siding and blue trim, who had painted it such odd colors just to leave it rot away alone up here? And the next house down from that, whatever happened to the kids who used to play on the rusted hulk of a swing set rising from the weeds in the backyard? We eventually came to a sort of cul-de-sac at the top of the hill. In reality, it was a teardrop-shaped turnaround that also served as the driveway for the largest house in the neighborhood. The place wasn't terribly huge, but it sat in an impressive way that almost seemed intentionally imposing. Not so much a castle, but the derelict manse of some wealthy duke. A menagerie of wood and glass and rusted iron that swayed up over the four of us like a shadow. Marley was the first to lay his bike and to turn around and start walking toward the place. He lifted his glasses off his nose and cleaned the skin there with the sleeve of his jacket so they'd stop slipping. Then he turned to Ricky. You know this fucking place was here? Marley asked. Ricky just shook his head. Just that there were houses up here, he said. He looked back at Mike and me like we might have known. We shrugged at him and set our bikes down as well. I put mine in the grass at the center of the old turnaround, a scruffy patch of green persisting despite the deepening cold. I gave a second glance to the statue at the center of it, a pewter fat man holding a tarnished copper umbrella. We walked around inside the house for an hour, together at first, then splitting up when we couldn't all decide on what part to check out next. I ventured toward what I thought would be the attic, where the others didn't want to go because of the thick cobwebs hanging over the stairs. They cleared away easily enough, however, and I found my way to the fifth floor of the place over several minutes. I found an office of some sort, complete with a nice, if not overly large, desk pressed against the wall to the left of the stairs. The room was small, the entire fifth floor really being little more than the pinched attic space at the very pointed top of the massive house. Windows opened in all four directions out of the box-shaped office. I could see our bikes through the dusty glass of the window on my right. I only supposed there was a window in the wall directly opposite me, given the bright corona shining around the bookshelf snugged into the alcove there. I wish the thing still held some books, but it was completely empty missing a few shelves even. The desk still had its chair though and I sat in it, smoothing the dusty surface with my palms and listening to the others creeping through the floors below me. I wondered what it would be like to have an office like this, to have time in such a place to read on my own. The others, mostly Ricky and asshole, gave me no shortage of shit for reading and I usually had to keep my books hidden so they wouldn't steal them and draw dicks in the margins or block out sections of text with a marker. Now that I'm older, I think that was their way of dealing with their own inability to read for any length of time. Asshole never finished a book in his life. He got through his AP literature classes by buying notes off better students, usually me, or occasionally splurging on Cliff's notes when we didn't have class together. I looked around the room, taking in the dark corners and the thin divisions between the weather-warped wood paneling on the walls. All the while, I tapped my fingers on the desk like it was the keyboard of a typewriter, imagining myself as somebody who wrote novels, instead of merely reading them. I only barely noticed asshole, Mike I mean, wandering around in the backyard. He was wearing a dull, red-hooded sweatshirt that starkly contrasted the patchy brown and green rear lawn. I hadn't seen the back portion of the house yet, and was surprised by how big it was. Its borders encircled a clearing maybe the size of my high school football field, divided into a series of three concentric, leveled terraces. The outermost of these three was the largest by far, in both circumference and land area. The smallest terrace was covered in weed-spotted river stones and formed a sort of patio in an almost onk-like shape, being a teardrop that spread into a broad, flat line at the end of the taper. At the center of the teardrop was an empty stone reflecting pool now run riot with moss and mushrooms. 
The second terrace was overgrown with weeds and wild flowers, more free-flowing and natural shapes that had replaced what had certainly been a well-manicured garden. An ornate construction, complete with vine-covered arches and a sort of hedge maze, now rendered insolvable by the overgrowth. The largest terrace was simply yard, still vast and sharply edged despite the wild things growing in place of the intended lawn. The only deviation from this description was a set of boulders, blackened, it seemed, as though by ash from a fire, several fires probably, to cover their inner sides with so much of the dark stuff, which stood in stark contrast to the sun-bleached whiteness of their outer sides. Asshole, Mike, walked through the gardens with his hands out in front of him, picking his way through the foliage. He moved gingerly, which looked odd from five stories up, but I would later discover much of what grew in that garden bore well-hidden and incredibly sharp thorns. He moved as though in a trance, entrancing me himself as I watched his careful foot-for-foot -foot movement through the second terrace and down a series of hidden stairs to the third. Then he was walking through the much tamer grasses of the bushy lawn and spinning to take in the surroundings. He even cast his eyes up to the fifth floor, and I waved, though he didn't seem to notice. Then he took a sudden and direct path through the blackened boulders and the space that lay between. For the life of me, I thought I was dreaming. At the time, especially, I did. Though given what's happened in the days and years since, I've no cause to question what I saw from my perch in that dusty garret. It was an arm, so impossibly long and thin and jointed, I figured it had to be an old stick he was moving out of the way. But that wasn't it at all. It crept from that dark space between the rocks and its thin fingers intertwined in Mike's. It lifted his arm over his head. At the time, I thought he was simply lifting the thing himself but then a second branching appendage slipped into the light. Slender fingers, so long and thin I could really only see the motions they made rather than the form of them, traced their ways along the contours of Mike's hip and stomach. I saw his face rise gently, as though to give somebody a better look at him, and then the fingers were tracing the lines of his jaw, his lips. My younger self, Mind still competing with the shared realities of the thing being either an arm or an odd branch, tried to formulate some excuse for what I was seeing. The possibilities I arrived at were so banal and stupid, and even oddly jealous, that I won't recount them here. I watched these branched things touch my friend, pull at him, and eventually lead him into the dark space between the rocks. It was only then that my senses seemed to come back to me followed almost in time by a terrible thump on the roof over my head. The noise was so severe I ducked instinctively. The room I turned to when I raised my head no longer seemed the dark and seductively inviting garret. It was simply cramped and dirty and old and dangerous. Even as I looked around, something slipped past the window facing the front yard to shatter on the ground, a heavy dead branch or something similar. I glanced one last time out the back window and saw nothing but the stately old yard, as empty and overgrown as the back lot of any cemetery. Mike was already in the front yard when I came downstairs, chatting idly with Marley about what they'd found on their respective trips through the house. I was already focused on forgetting the odd thing I'd seen happening to Mike, who seemed fine, save for a bandage wrapped around his right hand. He seemed more than fine, actually. Almost invigorated. He gave me a rakish smile as I walked up to them. What did you find, Ash? He asked. I told them about the little garret office on the fifth floor, having to back up to explain what a garret was once I used the word. Then, of course, having to sit through the usual, then why didn't you just say that cliché people like to dump on 17-year-old me? when I used my more decadent vocabulary. It's not something I have to apologize for anymore. By 47, I've all but culled people like that from my life, and those who don't understand the words I use keep their mouths shut for fear of embarrassing themselves in front of me. That might sound harsh, but... Imagine 
having to talk like a baby in all your daily conversations for fear you might offend the fragile egos of the semi-literate. Marley had searched most of the second and third floor, a series of bathrooms and what he said were a weird amount of kids' rooms. Not like kids' bedrooms, he said, pushing at the glasses. The noonday sun had us all sweating in our jackets. He took his glasses off to clean the nose pads, squinting blindly around the cul-de-sac as he did so. More like playrooms or something? There were drawings on the walls and broken toys and all sorts of weird shit. Like? I asked. But he shrugged and didn't bother to continue. One of Marley's many irritating habits. I turned to Mike. How about you? He shrugged. Oh, I checked out the kitchen and the rest of the first floor, he said. Somebody left a whole fucking piano in there. Isn't that crazy? Marley said yes, it was. What about the backyard? I asked. Mike gave me a weird look, coupled with that same odd smile. A shit-eating grin I wasn't accustomed to seeing on his face. What about it? He replied. I thought I saw you back there. I said, pointing up to the fifth floor. There's windows up there you can see the backyard from. In your garret? Mike said. He brushed the question off and started talking to Marley again like I hadn't asked it. But before he turned away, his eyes flashed angrily at me. It was only a second, but I saw it. Like a dog baring its teeth. It wasn't something completely foreign to Mike. In fact, it was sort of the reason the nickname Asshole had stuck to him for well over a decade. He had a sulky, spoiled streak a mile wide down in the heart of him. I don't know where it came from, but if anything, it set the final bridges between us on fire. That was it. Check this shit out, Ricky said, coming up from the side of the building with two big green bottles in his hands. There were no labels on the things, but even from a distance I could make out the shadows of liquid and sloshing around in them. It's like some fancy fucking basement wine. Oh yeah? Mike asked. How do you know? Because, asshole, it's on a bunch of racks in the basement, Ricky said, waving the bottles around his head like an idiot. Only I seemed to notice Mike glaring at him. Just like in the movies? Marley asked, smiling with just the corner of his mouth. Ricky gave him a snotty look and then grinned. You're fucking right. Just like in the movies, he replied. Let me see that, Mike said, trying to grab one of the bottles. Ricky looked at him like he was an idiot and swung it outside his reach. Hey, asshole, these aren't for you, he teased. There was the briefest pause, like when you're about to crash your car and the whole world stops. Or maybe, like when the static on the ground turns and pulls up into the clouds before a lightning strike, clearing the air just ahead of all that heat and fury snapping down to the earth. Then the pause broke and Mike snapped forward, almost like he was falling, and smashed his fist into Ricky's face. The older boy's nose popped like a tomato and both bottles went flying. One skittered over the pavement unharmed, while the other bounced twice and exploded. The scent of wine and blood mixed into the crisp October air. Marley stepped forward, eyes wide and hands up, while Ricky just lay there. I fucking hate that name! Mike yelled at Marley, spinning on him like he was about to catch the next round of knuckles to the face. Marley froze and even stepped back. Of all of us, he was the tallest, with me being the shortest and Ricky and Mike being basically the same height. But he was also the lankiest. Mike had maybe 20 pounds on him and Ricky had a good 40 on Mike. What I'm getting at is there's no way either of us could stop Mike if he lost his shit now, which was a sudden and terrifying revelation. None of us had ever hurt each other like that. We'd always just assumed Ricky could kick everyone's ass and that was that. No reason to find out if it was really the case. 
But now Mike had a look in his eyes that froze us in place. He stepped over the writhing, half-conscious Ricky and picked up the shard of broken bottle by the neck. The glass descending from his hand glittered, a dozen sharp knives arranged in a circle. Marley stood with his hands up in the air. Well, I thought of maybe doing something mildly heroic like standing in front of Ricky. Maybe. I hate that fucking name, Mike said, sniffing the glass and then, thankfully, tossing it into the grass at the end of the turnaround. Things de-escalated so quickly after that it was like nothing had happened at all. The only evidence was Ricky's fat nose and the bib of blood on his shirt. I thought he'd be pissed, but it seemed Mike had properly chastised him. They were even joking around with each other by the time we got back on our bikes, though I noticed Mike had stuck the bottle inside his jacket. This is a pretty cool place, Marley said, and we all agreed, though the fight had clearly ruined whatever good mood might have been there. Yeah, Mike said, looking up at the trees and nodding. You know, we should come back and uh, get some of this wine tomorrow. Maybe bury it somewhere. We could probably put it at your parents' place, right, Ricky? Oh, yeah, Ricky said, generally looking down at the ground in front of his bike and wiping sniffles of bloody snot on his wrist. That's fine. Probably. Cool, Mike said. He was riding in front of us now instead of Ricky. It may have been something only I noticed, though he did occasionally flash that weird smile back at me. You guys can come, but I, I think me and Ricky can handle it on our own, right? Yeah, right, Ricky said. The big teenager, the oldest of all of us, looked like he was going to cry. Mike swerved side to side on the broken road. Then he slipped onto the path through the trees and Ricky slid in behind him. And, because I swept my bike in a big arc to look back at the big old house, that was the last I ever saw of Ricky. By the time I was finished taking in the dead, ruined neighborhood and back on the trail, he and Mike had already blown free of the woods and were headed back to their respective homes. Marley called to me before he left, sort of asking me if I'd be okay alone up here on my own. It was a mildly irritating habit he'd picked up around the time I turned 15 that I'd never corrected or called him on, though I found it boring at the best of times. I waved him away and he was gone tossing out something along the lines of, I'll see you tomorrow. Then he was gone too. And I don't know why I stuck around looking at that old house, or why I cycled back up to it, driving past the pond of wine and glass. The house was situated so that the sun was at its back at this hour of the day, giving the entire artifice a vignette of shadow that didn't quite reach the cracked wooden siding by the front windows. I glanced up at the little fifth-floor office, my garret, and saw nothing but the square, capped shape of it. From the ground, it looked like something that would normally house a bell, though I knew better then, of course. But even as I looked, what I had thought was a weather vane or some other ancient ornament, this curved, inverted pendulum shape on a stick, sunk slowly behind the ridge of the roof until it was gone completely. Already standing beside my bike instead of on the pedals, I took several steps toward the building, hoping to catch a better angle of what I'd seen where the sun wouldn't leave it in silhouette. Something crunched under my feet and I looked down to see the partial remains of a brass weather vane, badly corroded from decades of exposure and shattered from falling off the house. I remembered the noise of something thumping against the roof while I stood transfixed by the spectacle of Mike and the branching arms in the yard. Some instinctual mathematics played out in my head and I began moving my body into position on my bike. Slowly, as though not trying to instigate a charge from some unseen predator. I became suddenly and acutely aware of the silence of the dead neighborhood. In the distance, through the trees, I could hear the distant rush and rumble of the highway as people commuted home from work. Here, deep in the forest, it could have been the sound of a water-fattened river breaking its banks. It had been some time as well since I last heard the crash of my friend's bikes moving through the woods. 
I was a short, slender thing and terribly, terribly alone. Without warning, to myself, as absurd as that sounds, I began to pedal maniacally away from that place. But raised in the air like a Tour de France racer, I used every fiber of muscle in my legs to push that bike as fucking fast and far from that house as I could, thinking of nothing but what shapeless shadow things might be twining out from between the rocks to wrap my face in their scratchy tendrils. There was no chase. I made it home in record time, sweat soaked and scratched head and shoulders from barreling through the woods, but alive and otherwise uninjured. I soon put the experience out of my head, chalking every odd thing I had seen up to my viciously overpowerful imagination and what my psychiatrist at the time liked to call my desire to see things that aren't there. The only thing I couldn't shake was one image from the mad dash away through the teardrop-shaped turnaround and the tuft of grass there, where there had once been a statue of a fat man holding an umbrella, lay a pile of formless, shattered stone, ground almost to powder in places, like somebody had been stomping on it. I soon managed to make myself forget I'd seen that too, or at least I made myself stop fixating on it and I did my homework and played video games and finished my day like the teenage shut-in I generally tended to be. By the time I went to bed, the events of the day were more to me like something I'd dreamed up than anything that had actually happened. And, by that next afternoon, the police were sitting on the love seat across from me and my parents, letting me know that my good friend Ricardo Diaz was dead. Maybe even murdered. It was the only thing people talked about, and then it was something people never talked about at all. By the time Thanksgiving rolled around, Ricky was just one of the names that made it into the first five minutes of a speech at any given event. Thoughts and prayers for the family. Let the authorities know if you have any information. Also, don't forget to donate to the boosters if you haven't already. Joggers had found Ricky at the bottom of a holler the day after we'd gone to that house about a hundred feet down from a sheer cliff edge. The police told me and my parents that it was lucky they saw him at all, given how thick the foliage was and how far out into the hills they decided to go off-roading. Another couple of days and his body might not have been found until spring. They asked me all sorts of questions about Ricky, but in all things, like when I'd seen him last and who he'd been with, answered honestly and incredibly personal things, like whether I'd been in relationships with him or any of my other friends, answered begrudgingly. I'm honestly surprised at how much I cried over the whole thing. By the time they were done and gone, apologizing for the difficulty of the questions before donning coats and heading out into the night, I was an emotional ball shivering myself to pieces inside a hoodie. My parents, good people to this day, offered to talk about it with me or even schedule an early visit with my shrink. I declined on all fronts, choosing instead to cope the way I always did, by smoking pot in the woods behind my house and then curling up with a book in my room. My parents knew about and tolerated my habit, though the talk my dad had with me about drugs shortly after I started smoking was far beyond awkward. Not as bad as the sex talk when I was 12, but bad. I started crying again, out there in the tree shadows of the deepening October night. It started because of a terrible, stupid, and selfish thought I had while smoking, that I would have to find somewhere else to buy weed. Ricky was dead, after all, and he couldn't be my part-time dealer anymore. It was an idiotic thing to cry over, I know now as an adult. If anything, I can say the late Ricardo Diaz would have likely found it hilarious that Of all the things I could be upset about regarding his passing, I was worried about my weed connect. My reaction at the time was to stub out the roach and flick it off the cliff that made up the rear border of my backyard. I watched it fall, a dark speck against the cobalt blue of the Kanawha River, and thought again of Ricky despite myself. Perhaps to spite myself. Who knows? I froze 
wiping my face and looking out over the dark expanse of the Kanaw River Valley and the city lights flickering off the water. I was seeing something utterly, insanely impossible. I rubbed harder at the tears in my eyes, trying to clear away the blur so I could see better. See the mad spectacle, or, better yet, convince myself that I was not seeing it at all. There was a man in flight, hovering several hundred yards over the silent Kanaw. He dangled by one arm from an old-timey umbrella, swept back from the canopy as though his parasol had caught some incredible wind and was now dragging him across the sky. In fact, he hung in silhouette just above the distant horizon, the line of trees on the peaks opposite the river, and so perfectly that it was like somebody had strung a great length of invisible cord over the city. Cord he was sliding down so smoothly and quickly he seemed capable of flight. And the image, this delusion, would have persisted if I hadn't sobbed right then. An involuntary flexing of the sadness still lingering within me. A noise so soft I could barely have said to have made it. But he heard. The flying man. His smooth travel halted abruptly, so that he swung around in little circles beneath the canopy of his umbrella as he righted himself. Then, impossibly, incredibly, he turned toward me and began hovering in my direction. Slowly, steadily, sure. But I could see the silhouette of him growing larger. I could even make out some of the details of his clothing. The outmoded three-piece suit festooned with a dozen silver buttons. The gently incurved barrel of his top hat. And the great raincoat flapping behind him in the breeze as he floated toward me. I told myself I was imagining things. But I ran inside all the same. As I said before, Ricky's death was old news by late November. His death seemed to have been the final nail in the coffin for my group of friends as well. I rarely saw them, on purpose or otherwise, in the crawl of months that led through winter. There were the occasional brush-ins at the high school and the awkward phone call or two that went nowhere. But other than that, we were now all on our own. Of the three of us, only Marley seemed to mind much. He wanted to spend time with me, of course but couldn't work up the gumption to just ask after what he really wanted, and so I ignored him. It was too sad otherwise, to see him constantly chickening out of finally making a move, and he wasn't interesting enough for me to pursue on my own. In fact, nobody really was. I enjoyed being alone, to the degree that anybody does. To this day, I consider social interaction akin to spending time beneath the sun in your bathing suit. For some, it's wonderful and warm, and still yet for others, it is the only truly enjoyable thing in life. They bathe in it. It is how they glow. But I, darling, I burn, I blister, I peel. Mike, I was coming to find, is one of the center camp these days. He'd been in the same boat as us for years. Not so much a social outcast as a peripheral person, a background character to the various high school dramas. But he'd suddenly amassed a robust group of friends, pretty smiling people who somehow always looked ready to pose for a Colgate ad. He'd made a show of coming up to me with a group of them once. The word accost isn't correct for how he approached introducing me to his new friends but it's so fucking close I can't think of anything better. In fact, even in retelling this, I was so irritated by the whole debacle that overstating how much of a dick he was being isn't being unfair to him. Our interaction went something like this. Mike comes up to me and puts his hand on the lockers over my shoulder, saying something along the lines of, Hey, beautiful. I am not overstating this. An 18-year-old boy, one of my oldest friends, cornered me and said those words to my face, on purpose. Then, doing what I can only describe as a bad impression of the fawns, he kicks his thumb over his shoulder, tells me to be cool, and says, let me introduce you to some people. I might have hit him if I wasn't scared of him now. The last time we'd hung out, more than a month ago, he'd punched Ricky and broken his nose. 
The next day, Ricky had been found dead. And we really hadn't talked much after that. Of the three of us, only I was invited to Ricky's funeral. The cops had asked a lot of questions about that fight, by the way, though the investigation never really seemed to go anywhere. It, much like everybody's memory of the deceased himself, had faded and stalled and somehow vanished by the turn of the new year. I hadn't forgotten, of course, and given the nature of this retelling, I'm sure you understand that I still haven't. But at the time, I didn't believe Mike had anything to do with Ricky's death, though some other people did. Nobody thought he killed him or anything like that, but there was some suspicion that perhaps the fight and its aftermath had stirred some suicidal thoughts in Ricky's heart. No official version of the incident was ever released by the police, however. And to this day, the cause of death on Ricky's death certificate simply reads, Misadventure. I did. However, I believe Mike was being a complete and absolute fucking dick. And I told him so in a way I was sure would brook no confusion. You're being an asshole. Asshole. I said, clutching my books harder against my side and pushing him in the high part of his stomach so it'd hurt. His eyes flashed, that same fiery look he'd given Ricky. But thankfully he didn't punch me in the face. The group of smiling idiots behind him probably stayed his hand as much as anything. I'd heard he'd been throwing parties at some place in the woods. I figured, much as you probably might, that he was taking his guests to that massive house in the dead neighborhood, but, as I'd come to find out, that supposition would prove false. But the throwing of parties was certainly helping him climb the ladder, to the point he had his own entourage of fairly popular students. Kids whose accomplishments were regularly called over the loudspeakers each morning. Even Stephanie Kirkpatrick, the glowing blonde gymnast who led our mock United Nations, stood beside Mike with a dumb look on her face and her fingers tucked in his pocket. Instead of punching me, asshole simply smacked my books to the floor and then walked by without sparing a second glance. Yet again, and not for the last time in this story, earning the ever-loving fuck out of that nickname he so hated. Even more strange, I noticed he had a tattoo now on the back of the same hand he'd crudely bandaged at that old house. An odd collection of lines and a curve that reminded me of the shape of the backyard where I'd seen those branching arms reaching out to him. Hey there, Westsiders. Are you being haunted by an unknowable, implacable creature with an umbrella and fishhook fingers? Well, if you're not getting the vitamins you need, maintaining the healthy routine you need to survive might be harder than you think. Even impossible. Thankfully, there's Care Of, a wellness brand that makes it easy to get the right vitamins, supplements, and protein powders for your specific needs. Go to TakeCareOf.com and take their fun, easy, and personalized five-minute quiz. Answer some simple questions about your lifestyle and diet and health needs, and they'll give you a research-backed recommendation of the vitamins, supplements, and or protein powders that could help you round out a healthy lifestyle. I took the quiz and, I'll be honest, like 90% of their <laughs> recommendations were to help me account for my terrible drinking habit. I ordered the products I thought made sense for me, magnesium, vitamin C, some stuff called ashwagandha, and others, and they came to my house in these like adorable little baggy things I've been composting in my backyard. If you want to keep life from picking you up and dropping you off a cliff, outrun your own umbrella man by going to TakeCareOf.com and using promo code WF for 25% off your first order that's takecareof.com just use promo code wf for 25 percent off your first order marley found me at lunch a week later looking more strung out than usual he had a habit of overdoing things, and with the second SAT date of the year rapidly approaching, he was overworking himself. I set my book down when he started yammering at me, voice low and suspicious. He didn't even bother saying hello, just launched into a conversation he didn't realize he was having with just himself. Jesus, I said, putting aside a copy of Night of the Hunter. What's your deal? He stopped talking and took a breath. 
slipping his glasses off his face and wiping them clean on the light blue button-up shirt he was wearing. In a world of torn denim and flannel shirts, Marley bucked the trend by wearing no bottom that couldn't be belted and no top that couldn't be tucked. He wasn't a nerd, per se. In fact, he escaped any perfect designation, being something of an accomplished cross-country athlete, though not the best in the school, as well as enjoying a fairly high rank in the student government. He would never attain the illustrious heights of student body president, of course, because he was too skittish and utterly lacked the ability to assert himself. But people respected him. I keep seeing Ricky, he finally said, hissing the words through his teeth. He ran his fingers through his hair and down his face. Oh God, it feels good to finally get that out. He smiled at me, an almost colorless gesture. Thanks. I didn't point out that after nearly three years of all but hounding me, it was ironic that hallucinating the image of our dead friend was what he was glad to get out. I took a breath and looked around, but nobody in the lunchroom had heard him. It wouldn't be the worst thing if somebody heard him going on like that, but it was still high school. People were fucking awful, and you couldn't show weakness. Especially mental weakness. What are you talking about? I asked. He drummed his fingers over the table and then left without saying another word. He was gone so long that I gave up waiting for him and went back to my book. Finally, he returned with a smash of his plastic tray onto the table that made me jump. I glared. He didn't notice. I made a mental note to slap him if he mumbled another prom invitation to me in a couple of months and then set my book down beside the tidy remnants of my lunch. In this case, an apple core and the thin paper baggie my mom packed my sandwiches in. Plastic bags were not allowed at our house. I've been seeing Ricky everywhere, he said. His lunch, a reeking menagerie of shapeless fried things, smoked gently on the tray before him. He ate, chewing and swallowing between sentences. This effect I will not commit to paper. Everywhere? I asked. In windows, mostly, he said. But also sometimes in the woods. Just a few trees in when I'm moving fast or I can't look twice. Like in a car or on the bus, you know? He gulped down most of the soft drink he'd bought with the meal. Marley's parents were well-compensated medical professionals. And he'd always bought lunch as long as I'd known him. Or bought expensive pre-packed lunches that nobody else but him could afford. Have you told your parents? I asked. He gave me a flat, stupid look. Of course not, he said. They'll send me to a shrink. That's sort of what I'm getting at, I told him, returning the same flat, stupid look. I absolutely loathed the conversation I could feel coming. One of Marley's most common in which he'd ask for advice and then shoot down every suggestion I made so he could work out whatever idiotic plan he'd formulated. I cannot stress enough that this man, this boy, was constantly trying to get me into a relationship. I believe, honestly believe, he was secretly a murderer who planned to get me alone in the backseat of a car somewhere so he could bore me to death. I can't go to a shrink. People will think I'm crazy, he said, working on a pile of crinkle fries. Without ketchup, mind you. Without ketchup. I go to a shrink, I told him. Nobody thinks I'm crazy. You're bipolar. It's different, he said, not looking at me. He rattled off my diagnosis in a way that made me want to smack him with the book sitting by my hand. It was a hardcover. It would do damage. Not really, I said. Schizophrenia starts to manifest in the late teens and early twenties. He gave me that same stupid look, but I pushed on. And if you have PTSD, that can cause delusions, hallucinations, all kinds of things. PTSD. PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder, I said. It's a condition you can get from seeing or experiencing something terrible. He just stared. 
like the death of a friend. I said this last sentence in a leading way, going so far as to circle my hand in the air like, hey, catch up, stupid. I know you like poring over that psych manual. The DSM-3. Whatever, he said. But stop trying to diagnose me with something, okay? I'm trying to help you, you idiot, I said, snatching up my things and standing. He all but spilled his soft drink trying to get me to sit back down. I- I'm telling you things that might be causing you to see what you're seeing, asshole, so that you go and talk to an actual professional. God! I left and he caught up to me by the trash cans, dumping the remnants of his meal and pleading with me to stop. I would have ignored him and kept walking, but he looked so drawn, so worn out that I gave him another chance. You don't believe me, he said. I rolled my eyes and crossed my arms. The copy of Night of the Hunter dangled from my fingers. He shook his head. You know, of everybody I know, I thought you would believe me. You read all those fucking books? Shit like that always happens in books. He ran his fingers through his hair, pushing his glasses up on the back of his hand. I'm fucking cracking up. Look, I said pulling him to the side of the hall. A few people meandered past, talking about Christmas plans. You always work yourself too hard. You don't sleep. You drink more coffee than my parents. You're probably just seeing things. I sighed. It's not the end of the world. Just go talk to somebody. Thanks, Ash, he said, laying his hand on my shoulder. Not on the side, but on the top so that his forefinger was brushing the side of my neck. I stepped back so that his hand fell away, giving him a tight smile. I already knew he wasn't going to take a single word of my advice to heart. No problem, I said, leaving him alone by the garbage cans. When he couldn't see my face, I let the polite smile fall away and cursed him under my breath. I started ignoring Marley altogether after that. Between him and Mike, that meant I was now completely alone almost all the time. That wasn't a big deal as far as I was concerned. I had plenty of other interests to keep me busy. College applications and spending time wrapped up with books and a blanket in my room, mostly. Marley grew more unhinged until his parents pulled him out of school altogether. By the end, he was embarrassing himself almost every day, screaming at random things and ducking into doorways like he was hiding from someone. He tried to drag me into his mania a few times, slipping odd, barely legible notes into my bag or even replacing my bookmark with them when I was in class. I caught him once and told him off, ignoring his protests about Ricky slapping his palm against his window while he slept and other such nonsense. Having every eye in the room suddenly turn toward us was wonderful, and getting kicked out of class when he wouldn't shut up was even better. Probably the best part of that day was being lectured by the principal about how I could be a better friend to poor, talented, mad-as-a-loon Marley. I got the impression that Marley had told him we were an item of some sort which infuriated me to no end. The principal asked leading questions about my sex life that would be borderline inappropriate even coming from my psychiatrist, much rather the head educator of my school. Though, I have to say, I think actually the best part of the day was the 15 minutes I had to spend waiting with Marley in the glass-walled reception area of the principal's office. Most of the time he begged me to listen to him, but he spent the last few minutes with his head tucked between his knees, begging Ricky to stop looking at him like that, as well as begging me to see, just see, Ricky. But when I finally looked, I saw nothing but clear, Clean glass and the first few students emerging from their classrooms after the bell. I was fully cloaked in that dreamy sort of feeling you get from reading for a long time when I begrudgingly took out the trash for my mom. It was basically my only chore, she had reminded me, by calling up the stairs to my room. And, despite how engrossed I was in patterns of silk, I broke my concentration and put on all the warm clothing I could find and went out back to move the cans to the front. There were three of them, 
all steel drum types that clanged and clattered over the pavement as I dragged them from the dark behind our house to the curb. Snow dusted the tops of each can, though thankfully none of them were frozen shut. Even through the thick fabric of my mittens, I could feel the icy steel of the metal handles. Our neighborhood was most beautiful in the winter. Despite being on top of a mountain, it seemed more like you were in a cave once the thick trunked oaks and pines covered over with snow. The looping street that led to my house was dark but for the single street light down near the sharpest curve and the dull yellow glow of the other light that lay out of sight uphill. Frost crystals hung in the air, resting like blue diamonds on the coat of golden fog hanging over the street. I put the second of the trash cans at the top of the street and walked back into the relative dark of my backyard to secure the last can. Charleston glittered in the spaces between the trees, the canal a dusty white line of frost and broken flows bouncing off the river banks. But there was something else as well. I froze when I saw it, or rather the outline of it, my hand growing cold on the last can's metal handle. A man or a boy, the black shape of him tucked down amongst the trees. I shifted my head to get a better look, moving slow as possible and remembering the almost prey-like feeling of standing before that odd giant house in the woods. I wished the porch light on the rear of our house was brighter and almost on cue, it snapped off from lack of motion in the backyard. With the light gone, the darkness was immense cold and heavy, wavering blue afterimages, shapes made by missing illumination clouded my vision. I waved my hand frantically over my head. Nothing. I kept my eyes on that hole in the trees where I'd seen him. Him. My mind wandered frantically over Marley's insane ramblings from the past few weeks. Notes he'd stuffed in my bags and books had said mostly the same few things over and over again. That Ricky was upset with him and had come back from the dead. Maybe he wasn't crazy after all. I stepped further into the yard, still waving my hand over my head like an idiot. Finally, the light snapped on, nearly blinding me. I put my mitten over my eyes and peered into the trees, but there was nothing there. No man, no ghost of a dead friend. Just the city lights and soft moonlight shading everything a touch lighter. I dragged the can out front, and even while I was admonishing myself for being a superstitious idiot, I saw him. Not the shape of a boy or a man from the spaces between the trees, but the fat man with the umbrella. I blinked twice trying to clear my eyes of sleep or exhaustion or whatever ailment was putting this apparition before me. He stood. No, not that. He floated in a standing position beneath the streetlight at the far curve of my road. The only house down there belonged to an old woman who'd since been moved out into a nursing home, and so there was no chance of anybody seeing this impossibility but me. Light filled the ground directly beneath his feet. The shadow of him was a hazy disk lying on the ground a yard in front of him. I realized the cold of the trash can handle was burning my skin and I released it, stepping closer to my house as I did so. Just as the umbrella man began to hover toward me, arms high and out to his sides as though to greet an old friend. The light snapped on behind me again and I can make out no details of his face though the color of all his clothing and the umbrella were shades of dull brown. I felt a chill against the back of my neck, almost like a finger, and then I had the sense the umbrella man was putting on his warmest smile for me. It wasn't my own thought, I realized, though it almost felt that way. Instead, it was like a transmission being beamed into my head. A sense of radiant warmth that almost felt like curling up in a blanket beside a space heater on a cold day. Cloying. Deepening. I wanted to fall into it. To fall, to fall, and to fall. But there was a smell, too, like burning oil. Sick and chemical, it cleared my head and I snapped out of it. Whatever it was, the umbrella man froze momentarily in place 
standing upright again and fixing the absurd top hat on his head. Then he spun the umbrella with a flourish and pointed it at me, soaring so quickly over the street that the mist parted and spread flat over the ground in little waves. I ran from my front door and banged loudly on it, shouting for my mother to open it and let me in. I turned back to the fat man and saw his face for the first time, or what amounted to his face. It seemed a mass of putty, into which a handful of eyeballs, a mustache, and a crooked mouth had been smashed into place by somebody with an alien's understanding of human facial anatomy. His body fluttered behind him with all the noise of a bird on the wing, the subtlest rush of wind over cloth. But then he reached down to the street. I saw something glittering at the tips of his gloved fingers and traced his path with a flurry of screeching, flying sparks that made me cover my ears. He was mere yards away when the door opened behind me. I had been leaning on it so hard I fell against my dad and nearly knocked him to the ground. If that hadn't been the case, he surely would have seen the fat man change course and shoot suddenly into the sky. The umbrella man's putty face made an expression beyond elegant description. A pursing of his non-lips and a recession of the flesh around his eyeballs that I suppose might be surprise. Or, better yet, the sort of warm shock one might display at a surprise party. In the last second before he disappeared out of sight, the noise it made was little more than a slight poof. He raised a finger to the pursed lips laying vertically along what might have been his cheekbone. This is our little secret, that expression said. The threat of breaking that trust was implied by what rested at the end of that gloved finger. A thick, curving steel hook, glittering and untarnished despite its grinding into the blacktop. I thought that night was over, but of course it wasn't. I told my parents that I'd seen a man in the trees beside the house, which I suppose wasn't really untrue, and they called the police. Half a dozen officers searched the woods while a severe woman in a man's suit, not a pants suit, asked me questions on my parents' couch. These questions took an odd turn as well, though I don't think my parents caught on to it as much as I had. From what I gathered, this woman had spoken to Marley at some point in the past few weeks. She never said that outright, but she asked me questions that suggested someone close to me had been making complaints about stalkers as well. I made half a joke about a fat man with an umbrella to gauge her reaction, but she remained stony. Then we finished, and she made a quick call to her superiors over the phone. She came back, sat down, and told me Marley was dead. Maybe twenty minutes before I'd gone to take out the trash, he'd climbed the fence behind his house and jumped off the cliff there. His mother had felt the thud of him hitting the ground fifty feet down, and then had found the back door hanging ajar. Marley's father had been the one to shine a flashlight down into the gorge, illuminating his son's broken body in the pile of bloody snow and rock where Marley had landed. It was already looking to be ruled a suicide, the woman officer said, though there were some mild incongruities that didn't quite make sense. First, it was the fact that there didn't seem to be prints leading through Marley's backyard, despite the thick covering of snow. And the second thing, though the police had chalked it up to Marley getting snagged on something on the way down, were the five deep, almost bloodless, punctures in his wrist. I saw Marley the next morning at the bus stop. My heart leapt in my chest when I found him leaning against a tree beneath the streetlight where I'd seen the fat man last night. At first, I hoped it was a case of the police making a mistake that he was alive and just as boring and maladjusted as the last time I'd seen him. Okay, in a word. Fine. But it only took a second's inspection to realize he was anything but okay. He seemed only partially real, in fact. His skin, his clothing, even his normally green eyes were all a dark shade of gray. There were no gory traces of the wounds that had killed him, broken bones and blood splatter. Merely the dark and unnatural colorlessness. I looked down and saw he left no prints in the snow. His feet simply disappeared into it up to the ankle, as though it weren't even there. 
I looked around and, satisfied nobody was within earshot, I said hello. You killed me, he replied. I crossed my arms and cocked my head to the side. Really? I asked, glaring. You didn't listen to me, he said. His voice was as colorless as his body, though he sounded more the bored teenager than the lifeless ghost. You didn't help, and now I'm dead, Ash. You killed me. Fuck you, Marley, you selfish dick, I said, pointing a finger at him. He didn't react. I went to say more, but made sure to look around again before I did. This is some stupid bullshit. It doesn't even make any fucking sense, and you know it. Knew it. I threw my hands up. I don't even know if you're you. You killed me, Ash, he repeated. I sighed and shook my head. Jesus Christ, fuck fuck you, Marley, I said. Then I turned around and waited for the bus. Ricky showed up around lunch, gray and shadowy and standing like an absolute creeper outside the lunchroom window. He also accused me of having some hand in his death, though I was completely clueless as to how that was true. I even tried to grill him on the particulars, but all he ever did was repeat himself. I can't say what was going on. It made little, if any, sense at all. Between them and the flying man, I took my own advice and went to see my shrink, a nice downtown doctor named Martha Peters who refused to go by anything other than Martha. Martha and I had a nice chat, we always did, and she listened attentively while I went over the deaths of my friends and the police investigation. I even told her I thought I was seeing Ricky and Marley around, just out of the corner of my eye. I thought it impudent to mention Marley was, just then, pressed up against the glass of her fourth-floor office window as though he were standing on the ledge outside. He slapped the window with his hand, and though the glass didn't so much as wiggle, the strike boomed into the room like a mallet on a timpani. The sound was loud enough that it made me flinch. Are you okay, Ash? She asked. I smiled at her and nodded. Just gotta sneeze, I said. When I looked to the window again, my breath caught in my chest and I had to ask for a drink of water to get back to rights. There, dawdling about in the distance over Charleston like some mad, fat male Mary Poppins was my umbrella man. He dangled from his parasol, kicking his legs back and forth below it like he was hanging on for dear life. Then he swung up and over the umbrella so that it was inverted beneath him and he was sitting in the bowl of the canopy. He doffed his hat to me and I opened my mouth to ask my therapist a question, engineered to get her to look out that window without me having to mention why I needed her to do so. But he seemed to predict that move and quickly put his finger over his lips. Steel glittered as the umbrella man slowly rotated upside down, and then rose up and up and away into the sky, still sitting in the bowl of the umbrella. I dreamed that night of long, branchy arms crinkle crackling out of the dark recess behind the old house. I was naked and walking into their embrace, brain fuzzy and eyes only half focused. A fire raged behind me, so hot the skin on my back, butt, and legs hurt. That itchy sort of pain that comes before a real burn. But it was cool inside the little cave, the alcove where the twitchy arms were leading me. I would be fine there if I just let go. They would caress me and cool me and let me breathe the deep, wet air, and everything would be fine. I woke in a sweat, despite it being early February and still only ten degrees. The inside of my room wasn't terribly warm either. My parents preferred to keep the heat off or as low as possible during the winter. It was around noon on a Saturday, and even the sunlight looked cold. It fell in chilly blue lines across my bedroom. I could hear my mom calling to me from downstairs, saying that I had a visitor. They could only be one person, the only friend I had left. I'd have preferred to just go back to sleep, but that wasn't in the cards. I yelled down to mom that I'd be ready in a few minutes and to let whoever it was to know I wasn't expecting company today. To her credit, she relayed the message loud enough that I could hear adding that her and Dad were stepping out for brunch. I already knew that it was more for Mike's benefit to let him know to stay downstairs. 
I stripped down and got a shower in the hall bathroom, having to ignore Ricky's stupid empty eyes ogling me from outside the bathroom window. The hot water felt odd with the mix of temperatures my body was feeling at the moment. That hot, sweaty feeling from when I'd woken up still hadn't faded yet, and I found myself turning the heat further and further down until the shower was groundwater cold. I dried off and brushed my teeth and generally took my time getting ready, hoping Mike would get bored and wander off like he usually did. That would save me all the hassle of having to tell him to fuck off, which I would have asked my mom to do if it had literally been any other person on earth. But if I had her get rid of Mike on my behalf, I'd have to have some long talk about it later. There was also the possibility that maybe he knew what was going on. That maybe he was seeing Ricky and Marley lingering around as well. But in my gut, I thought that wasn't the case. I walked back down the hall in my towel, hair flat and drying over my back. I wouldn't have taken the time to wash it any other Saturday, but I was in the mood to grind on Mike and so I had. Despite the relative chilliness inside my house, I was surprised to find my damp hair wasn't making me cold. I was wondering over the possibilities behind this bizarre internal temperament while walking into my room when a hand touched my shoulder and I screamed and fell against my closet door. Mike, asshole, stood grinning beside the little white Ikea desk my parents had bought for me in ninth grade. I glared at him and pulled the towel tighter around myself. Then I pointed at the door. Get the fuck out, Mike, I said. He sighed and rolled his eyes. You want me to wait downstairs? He asked, flashing me that irritating, rakish smile. I mean, get the fuck out of my house, asshole. I said more sternly. He didn't glare, but his body language harshened. He sighed. Really, he hadn't stopped sighing all throughout that exchange, and then stepped past me. I expected him to close the door when he left but instead he closed it and didn't leave at all. I felt my body flush with adrenaline, a hot, shaky feeling not unlike the one in the dream I'd woken from. We need to talk, he said, turning slowly and leaning against the door. Mike, I want you to leave, I said. But he didn't. Instead, he made a sort of pouty face at me. Ash, we need to talk he said. About them, mostly. He nodded to my bedroom window, where Ricky and Marley were staring in at us. Well, no, at me. Their eyes made me want to pull the towel even tighter, but it was already strained near to tearing. I took a deep breath, trying to decide what to do next. It was painfully clear that something had gone badly fucking wrong with Mike. Whatever, I said. I need to put on clothes. Can you talk to me from the other side of the door, at least? He sighed again and gave me a conciliatory smile, then shook his head slowly. I rolled my eyes. Can you turn around, then? Sure, he said, obliging me, then adding playfully, I promise not to peek. I couldn't make Ricky and Marley give me the same consideration. The only consolation to my dignity was that it felt more like being looked at by the plastic eyes of a stuffed animal. There was nothing left of them to react to my nudity, nothing about them that could care or judge. Still, I dressed in a hurry, slipping on the first pair of underwear I could find, my jeans from the day before and one of my New Order t-shirts, the one from the album with the flowers on the cover. Okay, I said, and Mike turned back toward me. I told myself the way he looked at me was just because he was interested in what I was wearing and nothing else, but of course I'd be wrong. He gestured to the bed. I just glared at him. I'll stand, I clarified. He shrugged and dropped onto my bed, disturbing the pink and purple striped comforter I'd haphazardly thrown into place after waking. I hated the way he leaned back on his hands, chest pushed up, head resting cheek to shoulder while he took me in. And I realized that was what he was doing, taking me in. Like he was eating me somehow, even just by using his eyes. 
I made a mistake, he said, after a long silence. He rubbed his chin with his right hand and I could see that odd tattoo perfectly. It wasn't a tattoo, though, I realized. It was straight-edged, like somebody had drawn it in place. But it didn't look like ink on or in the skin. Instead, the colored skin looked like a bad wound that hadn't healed properly, creating an odd and horrific scar. Just looking at it made me scratch an imaginary itch on the back of my own hand. He saw and held the weird mark up to his own inspection, turning it back to me when he'd finished. I realized the thing wasn't black, but rather a very, very deep purple. This is part of, well... He took a deep breath and sat forward, putting both his hands on his knees. From where I stood, our dead friends hovered equidistantly over his shoulders in the long, slender window above my bed. You might have noticed things have been different for me recently. You've been a dick, yes, I said, crossing my arms. I hated the way he was talking to me in that weird and pompous tone. He sounded like a pimp in a bad exploitation movie. One of the ones that isn't as much fun as it is uncomfortable. Whatever, he said. This. He made a fist with his right hand and tapped it on his knee. This has gotten me to where I need to be in life. Where I've always deserved to be. I looked at our two dead friends and then back to him, hoping to hear my parents walking in the door. It didn't happen, of course. What are you fucking talking about, Mike? I made a deal, he said, with power. A trade so I could finally realize my full potential. He stood up and walked deeper into the room, staring at my posters now with his back to me. I was such a pussy. I was afraid of going for what I wanted, of getting rejected, of, of being a man. He turned to me, that same fist clenched again and his face serious. So I made a deal, he said, gesturing his hand to the window. Them, for what I wanted. Ricky and Marley stared dull-eyed and stupid at me. You what? I asked, backing toward the door. My dead friends slipped out of sight. I traded them, Mike repeated. The deal was my best friends for a taste of power. Real power, power, like this. He lowered his eyes and I felt heat rising in my chest. A heady, vibrating sort of warmth like I'd never experienced. My face softened, my lips parted. I could barely breathe. All of the air was warm cotton holding me afloat. Do you like that? He whispered. He was suddenly very close. His fingers moved up to my cheek and traced the line of my jawbone. The feeling was electric. That's only a fraction of it, he said. His voice was soft. The room felt dark and close now despite the blue glow of the winter afternoon. I wanted something from him, a voice in my head whispered. I wanted it terribly. But I also didn't want that thing. In fact, that thing disgusted me. I wanted to move away from him from the tingle of his skin against mine. Lances of static played over the fine hairs leading up to my earlobe. Despite myself, I pushed my face into his palm. Or actually, something else pressed against the side of my head and moved it for me. Something alien and creeping that crawled along the nerves in my spine and head like little fibrous wires, pulling and shifting, getting me to where I needed to be, where it told me I ought to be. If I want something now, I just have to touch somebody, he said. Just a touch, a handshake, a pat on the back. This. His fingers moved up into my hair. The alien feeling was so profound now that it made me sick. But that sickness was like a fish hook sliding up out of a deep, dark river. I grabbed at it, made it mine. I swallowed it all, hook, line, and sinker, and felt it ripping me toward the surface. I've gotten almost everything I've ever wanted, he said, stepping away from me. 
The skin contact broke and I could feel myself slipping back down into the muck. He held his arms out to his sides and clenched his fists, grinning like an idiot. You know how badly I wanted to fuck Steph Kirkpatrick? I did it, Ash. I did it so many times I got sick of her and I did it with her friends, her sister even, and she's in college, a college girl. He laughed and jumped around in a circle, a gesture I was more used to seeing after he'd won a hand in Uno. I'd like to say I didn't recognize this boy in front of me, but I did. I think that's what sickened me the most. And just like that, I was slipping up out of the muck again. I have $200,000 just sitting in my room in my desk, he said now, smiling at me. I just walked up to people on the street and asked them to give me these, these little amounts, then more and more until I was walking around downtown Charleston with a stack of bills like this. He held his hands apart in front of his chest. In my backpack. It was so heavy, like, you wouldn't believe. His arms slapped down to his side. But all that? Getting Steph to suck my dick and getting that money and stuff, all oh, that was kid stuff. He continued. See, I can do some crazy shit here, I think, if I get far enough. Because it's only a touch, see? He rubbed his fingers over the palm of his left hand. He put a bashful smile on his face. I think I could be president, maybe even like king of the world if I play my cards right, he said. But there's one thing I want more than all of that, understand? And that one thing is where I made my mistake. He sighed. I guess it's one of those Faustian things. The trade was for my best friends, remember? That's what the crooked man said he wanted in trade. But I've never considered you a friend, Ash. He smiled at me in a way I'd never seen before. Then got nervous and looked away. Still, I remained frozen in place by whatever he'd done to me. That beguiling touch. I've wanted you since before I wanted girls like I wanted Steph. He chuckled. It's fun to fuck. And I guess we could do that, but I want you, Ash. I really want you. He looked at me as though I was going to say something in response to that. God only knows what he expected. If that was the way he'd felt, it was fucking news to me. We'd only ever just been friends, as far as I'd known. He seemed to take my silence as little more than a symptom of whatever he'd done to me. But so does he, Mike said, pouting and shrugging. I'm sure you've seen the fat guy with the umbrella floating around, right? That's not him. Just what he calls an agent. I guess you might think of him as a debt collector. Mike looked out the window, checking the sky. I knew what for. He helped me with Ricky and Marley, Mike said glumly. And all I had to do was take Ricky to the place in the hills. That house, remember? I did. Then Marley I had to freeze. That was part of the deal. He shook his head. Then he said he wanted you, and I had to do it myself. But I didn't want to. He gave me an imploring look. When you were taking the trash out that night, I was back by the cans, he said. You never even saw me because Ricky was down in the woods, he sighed. I thought if I just went in and got it over with, everything would be fine. But then I touched your neck and, well, the smell of you. I just couldn't do it. So I talked to the crooked man, and he said maybe you could make a deal too, Mike said, grabbing my shoulders over my t-shirt. There was no sudden burst of ugly pleasure. I don't know for what, exactly, but he said you could make a deal with him, and then you could be with me. Wouldn't you like that? He touched my face, and the cottony fugue fell over me again. Behind him, in the window... The fat man with the umbrella floated up into view. His hodgepodge of eyes were twinkling at me. Mike pressed his mouth to mine, and the feeling was unlike anything I'd experienced now or since, though the few heroin addicts I've interviewed during my later work described it to a T. His lips 
his transgressing tongue. They were everything in the whole wide world. The pleasure was full body and intense, so extreme that my muscles were twitching with their inability to handle it. But at the same time, it was utterly foul. There was a sickness in it, like running milk through a strainer to find a dozen white worms writhing against the mesh. It made me want to vomit, to curl up and die. And that feeling was that fish hook in my guts again, catching deep into the meat of me and dragging me up and up and up. I punched him, a soft jab with my right hand. Mike jumped and backed away from me, giving the knuckled nod of my fist a second glance before looking into my eyes. The feeling of him going was like having some vital piece of me ripped away. A sensation so visceral, I could almost see the thin, vibrating purple cord that connected him to me. I wrenched back and watched it snap. Then I was human again. Me again. Though my thoughts were muddy from whatever he'd done. I could faintly hear him asking me what the hell I was doing through the fuzz in my ears. Above that, Almost painfully clearly, I could hear the umbrella man laughing in the window. The sound of it was like an accordion with a stab wound playing the same sour note over and over. Mike stepped toward me with that cursed purple marked hand of his outstretched and I launched myself at him. It was a Hail Mary effort, the last possible maneuver. I knew that if I missed or didn't hit him hard enough, I'd fall to the floor and he'd put that hand on me again. Then he'd mull my mind, molding it and warping it until it looked no different than the putty face of the Umbrella Man. I wrote a story about a retired boxer for a magazine about six years ago. Until then, I'd thought my form that day was wildly ineffective. That what happened when I caught Mike in the face with that mad haymaker had been an absolute fluke. But according to that old pro, what I did is known in the boxing world as the Dempsey Roll. Without getting too deep into the specifics of it, what you should understand is that I hit Mike hard as fuck in his stupid fucking nose. Mike's head snapped back so far I thought I'd broken his neck. His eyes crossed and closed, and a torrent of blood spread over his mouth and chin. For a second, I remembered Ricky, still alive, bleeding just like that in the teardrop roundabout in front of the big old house. And then I landed on my face. Whatever spell Mike had me under vanished, though I felt like I'd lost a fat chunk of gray matter in the process of vanishing it. It took a monumental effort to get my feet underneath my body, and a good deal more to actually stand on them. But stand I did, wobbling just enough I had to lean against my wall to not fall. Mike rolled on the ground, cussing at me and crying and clutching his ruined nose. He'd always handled pain like a little bitch, but now wasn't the time to gloat. My eyes turned toward the window where I saw the Umbrella Man make an odd, surprised face and then shoot up out of sight. Mike took advantage of that momentary distraction and grabbed my leg. He tried to push his fingers up underneath my jeans and I swung a kick at him that not only connected, but made me think I'd torn something in my ankle. Mike curled around his stomach and I fell back on my ass. I got onto my knees and hands and scrambled for the door opening it and jumping out into the hall just as Mike's hand whipped past my face. I heard the crunch of plaster snapping and Mike howled and cursed at me. His fingers brushed the back of my neck as my feet hit the first step going down the staircase into the living room. Electric waves of pleasure, those maneuvering alien tendrils, spread out from the contact point and almost made me lose my balance. I did trip, really, but somehow I used the momentum to twist myself up and over the banister dropping myself to the first floor. Mike thudded down beside me a second later. I was already running into the kitchen, where I grabbed one of my mom's cast iron skillets off the wall. I turned and threw it at Mike's head, my fingers pointing straight ahead like I'd just hurled a tomahawk at him. The heavy iron pan clipped the front right side of his skull when he failed to dodge all the way, knocking him off balance into the wall. He slid, howling, to his knees and covered the nasty red mark the blow had left him. I ran past him without looking back, all but kicking my front door off its hinges and running to the garage. I thanked God my parents never locked the thing and threw it open in a single full-body heave. Normally, it was something of a struggle for me to get it open, 
but this time the segmented door hit the back of its track so hard it nearly shut again. It bounced painfully off my forearm as I dragged my bicycle outside and jumped on it. Ash! Mike screamed. I looked back at him and saw blood streaming down his face from where the pan had hit him. Between that and what I'd done to his nose, the blow from the pan seemed to have swelled his right eye shut. His remaining blue eye looked like a life preserver floating in the aftermath of a terrible shipwreck. He was already climbing on his own bike as I took off down the road. I don't know where I thought I might go. I just wanted to get away. The reality of what he might have done to me, what my oldest friend had planned to do to me, was only just then sinking in. I'm not ashamed to say I was crying. The tears burned my face, every inch of my skin ached from the winter wind cutting through the thin clothes I'd thrown on in my room, and I made a mental note to put on more sensible escape attire next time my only living friend tried to use his newfound psychic powers to try to rape me. I actually thought that whole last line out in my head while I was pedaling, and in the midst of all that pain and confusion, I began to laugh. I was still laughing when I looked behind me to see Mike gaining rapidly. Much of the blood on his face had dried to a cracking crust in the wind. More importantly, the umbrella man floated along behind and above him like some twisted kite. He looked at me as he whipped and withered, his parasol ever out in front of him to catch whatever unseen wind drew him toward his purpose. The medley of misappropriated organs in his face shifted and sank and emerged here and there and everywhere else through his putty flesh. I turned and pedaled harder, but there was nowhere to go. The entire downhill slope of the mountain, yes, but I knew I couldn't get away from Mike. He hadn't taken off the thick, warm clothing he'd been wearing when he came to my house. He wasn't bleeding heat and energy by the second, so that it felt like his head was splitting into pieces. I crested the last little uphill bit before the big, twisting, downhill sprint that was my neighborhood road. In a second, I was at my maximum speed, barely able to keep the bike upright as the tires vibrated violently beneath it. Mike caught up with me, pulling up on my right with his head tucked low against the wind. He was glaring when he reached and grabbed the naked fingers of my right hand. Warmth. Raw heat, really flooded into my numb flesh. I had no will left to fight it, I'm afraid to say. I couldn't bite down on that fish hook again to pull myself up out of the water, so he smiled at me and we floated down that black asphalt river hand in hand for a few brief seconds, like the teenage lovers he wanted us to be. I'm not afraid to admit I like that feeling, even thinking back on it now, all things in context. I can say I experienced something like true happiness in those small moments. I saw us together as he did, hand in hand, and I realized something. If he hadn't been the way he was, if, instead of keeping whatever secret lusts and wants he felt toward me buried in his heart, he had taken the time to let me know. If he possessed the barest bit of courage, I would have given him a chance. If he'd been direct, forward with his feelings, I might have fallen in love with him. The warmth that flowed out of his fingers tried to spread up my arm, into my heart and mind, but they reached a blockade. I was too cold, you see. Simply too cold. Slow down, Mike said. His words were calm, but his eyes were narrowed. I could hear the umbrella man skating through the wind behind me. Use your brakes. Fuck you, asshole, I whispered. Then I rolled back on my seat and kicked his handlebars, feeling my bike wobble and then disappear from underneath me. Mike's fingers were there and then gone, and for a moment I was floating in space. And I could see myself as though I were hovering over my own body, a wispy girl of seventeen with short, messy boy hair and no bra. My shirt fluttered around my body and my hair around my head. My eyes were soft and hazel, half open. My arms were flailing in a slow motion sort of way, almost like a backstroke. And that little girl I saw, that young woman, 
reached up to touch the face of the discorporate reflection gazing down at her, and the reflection reached back, and then all was dark. I woke a few dozen yards down the street, screaming with the first tender movement I could muster. I didn't have to touch myself to know I was bleeding, and badly. My back felt like I'd taken a dozen lashes at the pillory. Nearby, I could hear the steady ratcheting of one of my bike wheels in free spin. When I saw it, the ruin of my bike made me not want to look at my body. Somehow I pushed myself to my feet. I felt a jolt in my head that made me almost as sick as it made me dizzy, but I held my ground and took in the scene around me. Just under my feet was a yard of my own skin and scraps of my shirt. I looked down to see the remnants of the t-shirt hanging from my neck like a bib just barely covering my breasts. I turned my attention to the back of my arm, which looked like burger. Shit, I said, or something like that. He was still and silent, a half a dozen eyes arranged in a crescent down the right side of his face. They blinked and shifted and looked in disparate directions, almost as though a few of them were confused how they'd gotten there. I stuck my tongue out at him, because I was too tired to try flipping him off, and I didn't know what else to do. His own tongue flipped loose of an opening where a nose should usually be and waggled at me. Loose flesh around some of his eyes puckered in a sort of smile. Ash. Ashley, Mike said. I followed his voice to what was left of him. He lay in a pile against the base of an oak tree sprouting out of the ground maybe two dozen yards up from where I'd come to, just inches from the cliff edge and the glittering white expanse of the river valley. I won't get too into detail, but it was readily apparent he'd never walk again, possibly not live at all. I gave him a piteous look that I don't think he could see, given the condition of his skull. I did feel bad for him. Without the effects of whatever his touch did, Despite the fact that I'd done this to him because of what he'd tried, what he would have done to me, I felt bad for him. I felt terrible for him, in fact. It almost seemed like all this was my fault for not noticing whatever was growing inside him soon enough to help. Is she near me? He asked. His voice bubbled and cracked. Yeah. I said. The umbrella man swept closer to us. Take her. Mike said. Help me. I'll do anything. I put my foot on his shoulder and pushed. He simply vanished over the cliff edge, making no noise or sounds of protest. It seemed forever before I heard the soft thud of him hitting the ground. I didn't bother looking over the edge. There was no way on earth I'd be able to keep my balance. Instead, I looked at the umbrella man. He stood in the air just a couple yards from me, dark and enigmatic and brown. His putty face had assembled itself into a cheap Picasso, mouth and eyes crossways from each other on either side of a crude nose. I raised my arms as high as I could to either side of my body. What now? That gesture asked. Its odd mouth smiled at me, and it shrugged. Then it folded its parasol and lowered the point to the ground and disappeared down into the earth like fog sinking into a warming river. And it was gone. I spit blood onto the spot where it had disappeared. Then I stumbled to the side of the road, flopped down beside Mike's bloody tree, and slept. I'll spare you the details of my recovery. It was long, painful, and, eventually, full. The police listened to every detail of my story they needed to hear, all those that made sense, anyway. To their credit, they avoided making a big deal out of it. Perhaps there are people who'd like this part of the story to end with every single iota of the truth of what Mike had done to come out in the public eye. To say the least, What grip he'd had on the people in his circle faded shortly after his death, and all of them had to create their own stories to make sense of the coercions they'd suffered. But there was no public reckoning, 
No mugshot in the papers, just a quiet sort of whispering that, thankfully, rarely, if ever, mentioned my name. Given the state of my house, my body, and the scene Mr. Brian Raynard had come across driving up my neighborhood road to read the electrical meters for the power company, the cops didn't charge me for pushing Mike off the cliff. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I did it. The same lady detective who told me about Ricky went so far as to tell me so. Then she took my hand and squeezed it very, very hard. Mike got buried, and our principal said some nice things about him during the memorial service in the auditorium. Counseling was offered to any students who might have been traumatized by the spate of recent deaths at our school. The principal knew what happened. Enough of it to be fairly disgusted even putting Mike Colon's name in his mouth. But the service kept people from talking about what had happened. And, more importantly, from dragging me back into it. People forgot Mike in time, just like they forgot Marley and Ricky, and just like they'd forget each other and me and most everything else about high school in the years to come. The last person who ever brought him up to me never even said his name. Steph Kirkpatrick found me at graduation, pulling me aside into the bathroom before everybody had to sit down for the diploma ceremony. She said nothing at first, just wrapped her arms around me in a crushing hug that brought my cheek into close contact with her own. It was the first contact like that I'd had with somebody since Mike had touched me in my bedroom. I didn't think it would ever stop, she said, simply. Then, thank you, Ashley. We cried, and we parted. I never said another word to her, and last I heard of her, she lived in North Dakota with some guy she married after college. We don't talk. We don't write. I wish her the absolute best. That summer, while everybody else was shit-faced drunk or coming to terms with the blue-collar realities of the rest of their lives, I spent a lot of time in my room. I had nightmares all the time that felt the way Mike's fingers had felt. Good in a bad way. Bad in a good way. I hurt myself in ways I'd like to not discuss just so I could feel something that wasn't those feelings. It sounds worse than it was. Just picking at scabs, really. Eventually, I hopped on my bike and rode through the woods with a backpack full of 5W30 pens oil I bought from the gas station. I almost didn't think the dead neighborhood would be there. That it would have been some delusion I cropped up to deal with, some other thing in my life. That it had all been bullshit. And perhaps it had, for all I knew. But it was all still there where I left it. I walked around inside the big old house for maybe an hour, looking and touching and pouring the motor oil on anything I thought seemed important. Then I left my bike in the vestibule and burned that motherfucker to the ground. I think that old, weather-rotted building would have burned without the extra help I gave it. But the motor oil stench of the fire helped cover up some uglier scent that came from the burning wood. Something cloying and familiar that would go along well with the feeling of being drowned in warm cotton. A scent that might have had me wandering into the conflagration I'd started, just to find the source of it. But the fish hooks were in the meat of me now, and they'd never let up. And so I watched the place burn from a respectable distance, even going so far as to walk around the back with my last unused jug of oil. I didn't know what I'd find back there, in the recess where the branching arms had reached out to Mike. A cave of some sort, some ancient crypt, a great stone-lined hall that led deep into the heart of the mountain beneath my feet. But all I found were the remains of an old camp tucked between the boulders there. Some junkies, rural getaway. There had been hundreds, even thousands of fires in that little space. But the rocks were solid, and the embankment of the higher terrace was smooth and unspoiled stone. The only artifacts there were five old syringes flecked with mud from a recent rainstorm. The police found me in the teardrop turnaround sitting with my head tucked against my knees and my arms wrapping all of me I could touch. In the end, the fire I set burned down a building apparently owned by some reclusive descendant of the wealthy Compson family who declined to press charges. 
The West Virginia Division of Forestry, however, took umbrage with me burning down about two square acres of the woods around the property that caught after the building collapsed. I was sent to therapy in lieu of prison and spent most of what should have been my freshman year of college in the company of some wonderfully mad folk in Weston. I wrote a book about it that you may or may not have read called Skull Crickets that made me bizarrely famous and somewhat wealthy at a very young age. Decades passed, which saw me become a writer of some note, though Skull Crickets remains by and large the only thing people recognize me for. Most of those years I spent living anywhere but West Virginia. Namely, I lived in California and then Colorado. I guess I missed the mountains, though. The Rockies are cold and lifeless compared to the verdant role of Appalachia. And for the most part, this is where the story of the early parts of my life ends. The tale of Mike and Ricky and Marley. All dead now nearly twice as long as they ever lived. With me moving into an oversized and under-furnished mansion of a home in Guncott in West Virginia with my wife, Darcy. To save you all the details, a habit I should avail myself of more often, my writing was shit, and I thought a move could help. All that trouble with Mike seemed distant and unimportant in my later years. I'm almost 50 now, and I thought moving back to my home state, if not my hometown, might help me start getting the words to flow. And it did, I'm afraid to say. Afraid to say, that is, because after moving into this dreary old home, buried in the forgotten heart of nowhere, I made an odd discovery. Tucked into a hidden closet in the fifth floor garret, I decided to take as my office, a closet painted over years ago by the nameless former owners. I found an ugly old royal typewriter, and with that typewriter I found two things. The first was an aged brown umbrella of a familiar design and the second was a note written in a jagged, if delicate, hand. A note signed with a crooked character resembling a moon and stars, which read, A debt paid, for services rendered. And, god damn me for being a fool, I actually used the fucking thing. Well, everybody, that was the Umbrella Man. What did you think? Have you ever fallen out with a group of old friends as you grew up? Has anybody ever called in a floating demon thing to drop you off a cliff in order to pay up a debt to some unknown crooked thing? Let us know in the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club on Facebook. It's a place full of like-minded fans who talk about horror and literature and the show and whatever else comes to mind. They... And I would love to hear from you, so hop on over to Facebook and search for the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club today. While you're there, you can also follow our fan page just by searching West Side Fairy Tales, or if Twitter is more your speed, you can get to me at WS Fairy Tales. If you like pictures of creepy stuff and rabbits and sometimes food, then go to Instagram and follow us at West Side Fairy Tales. If you'd like to support us monetarily, please consider heading to westsidefairytales.com slash merch and buying a souvenir of the show. We have t-shirts, hats, hoodies, and even mugs and stickers and other stuff, so head on by if you have a few bucks and want to show your support. You can also support us on Patreon, where just $1 gets you early access to all episodes. Higher tiers get you access to special episodes, super early raw releases of the show without ads or intros, and even free merch. Contributions from listeners help this show to continue providing free, high-quality content, and we really can't thank all of you who support us enough. For those of you interested in a deeper breakdown of this month's recommendations, the novel It by Stephen King, and the video game Dead by Daylight from Developer Behavior, tune into the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club episode that will be dropping on the feed in two weeks. In those episodes, I provide some in-depth discussion on the recommendations, some history of their creation, and talk about what they mean to me as a horror author and writer. Also, if you'd like to chat with me directly sometime, you can hop into my almost nightly video game streams at twitch.tv slash westsidetyler. Basically, I play video games like that every night to relax, and I figured why not turn that into more work. (laughs) But uh, seriously, if you want to just hang out and listen to me talk about horror stuff, video games, and make fun of people while I kill them, Go to twitch.tv slash westsidetyler and like the channel.
That way it'll send you a notification the next time I'm on and you can just pop right in. I'll also be playing through some classic horror titles like Silent Hill, Resident Evil, and Alan Wake as the channel gains momentum. And even some newer stuff like Alien Isolation. Next month, we continue with the second episode of Season 4 of the West Side Fairy Tales, in which a neighborhood of elderly former power players must come to terms with the legacies they left behind. I hope you'll join me on the first Friday of November for the premiere of my story, Best Roses, Manassas, West Virginia. And, until next time, as always, stay safe out there. West Side Fairy Tales is written, read, scored, and produced by Tyler Bell. Episode art by Yui Breedlove. All content here in copyright 2019, WSF Productions, LLC.